And we're live. Hi, everyone uh, from across Canada and around the world. Uh, it's Lev with Trotec Glazer Canada. And we have uh, Mitchell here with uh, Nelson Mandela High School out of uh, Calgary, Alberta. Calgary, Mitchell, is that Correct. it? Correct. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so welcome to this um, AutoCAD webinar. Uh, we just want to go through kind of the basics of how to work with AutoCAD uh and the laser machine so it's going to be a software webinar we're not really going to be showing you uh the inner workings of the laser machines it's more for if you want to get started with autocad and and the laser uh that's what we're we're going to do if you have any comments or questions uh leave them in the the video this video will be public uh and then we'll try to answer and address uh your questions uh so mitchell if you want to just kind of give us a brief intro about who you are what you do that would be awesome. Absolutely. So I'm Mitch Way. I teach uh, full-time robotics at Nelson Mandela High School, one of the brand new schools in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, on top of that, I'm an AutoCAD certified professional, which is kind of why I landed here. As well, uh, we have a laser in the school. We use it frequently for our robotics projects, specifically a lot of FIRST robotics applications. Um, we run a first, uh, FIRST robotics competition, FRC team for our grade 11s and 12s here. In addition, we run two FIRST tech challenge teams, and we also have teams running out of our junior highs. So we get a lot of use out of this, and more and more this year, we've actually tried to use the laser to build more robot parts. And uh, as you can see behind me, we actually have an example of where we've used it for uh, building the superstructure of almost an entire robot. So I'm just going to pull this one up closer to the camera right now. So this robot has been built mostly with quarter inch plywood paneling. Almost all of it pulled off of the laser cutter. So one of the key advantages of AutoCAD and the reason we use it for this sort of thing is that it's really good at matching parts. It's really good at bringing in other files and making sure that you have a match to exact specifications of where holes line up, where bolts are going to go, where an overall structure of a robot might come together. And uh, it's this robot in particular was actually built originally in Fusion 360, so we could get all of the 3D um, basically associations correct. And then each of the panels was then pulled into uh, AutoCAD and was actually printed on the on our Trotec laser. So what do you, what, what kind of, I guess for people who don't know anything about AutoCAD, uh, how is that different from, uh, you know, regular design softwares like Illustrator or, or Corel Draw in that case? Hello? Yeah, Hello? sorry, you, yeah, you just, <laughs> did, you, uh, did you hear my question? I had a, had a connection issue. Yes, I heard your question. So AutoCAD versus uh, an Illustrator or something else like that, uh, it's way better in terms of its, uh, its precision level. A lot of what you can do in 2D, you can do in those other platforms, but you can also bring in parts files. And I'll show you a very quick example of this. Uh, one of our projects for one of our teams, actually, before you switch my screen here, um, one of our teams is actually trying to match this particular plate here uh, which is a Rev Robotics part, and they were trying to build a new base plate based off of it. And I'm going to try to show you a version of this later on in the webcast where we actually took the step files with the 3D printer files or uh, 3D model files from that piece of plastic, matched them in AutoCAD, and actually redrew over top of them to create a new part. All right. Well, with it, without further ado, let's uh, let's get on to uh, setting up a new uh, new AutoCAD drawing here. Uh, what we're going to try to do with this is we're going to try to create something similar to one of these. Now what these are is a motor bracket uh, using the Tetrix kit of parts. And the Tetrix kit is nice because we're gonna be working in metric here and it actually has eight millimeter centers to the center of all of the holes in front of you. All the bars are 16 millimeter, 32 millimeters across. Everything's a nice multiple of eight. So we're actually gonna be drawing this pretty much from scratch. So when we start with an AutoCAD drawing, one of the most important parts for lasering is making sure that you've got your layers set up properly. So when we start a new file, we just go up to our file menu here in AutoCAD, float over new, and we are going to create a file that uses the ACAD setting. You'll notice that you have a few different kinds of settings here, depending on if you're doing things in 3D, if you're doing things in ISO. We're going to stick to ACAD just to the basics here, quite easy. Now, you'll notice here that I've got a screen that probably doesn't look quite like yours. I like to keep a properties menu up here, and I've also been using blocks lately, so I've actually been using this menu as well. All menus in AutoCAD, you're able to pull them up right quite easily. You're able to pin them to sides of the screen. As well, you're going to hear me through this conversation do a lot of uh, 
a little bit of typing. Whenever I say I'm typing this, it means I'm using what we call the hybrid method of data entry for AutoCAD. One of the cool things is since AutoCAD came from the command line era of entering things into CAD, it still has most of that functionality. So for example, if I want to start drawing a line, if I type line in, I'm going to actually get a dynamic input command or dynamic input menu that asks me, is this what you want? In this case, maybe I do want a line. If at any point I get to a point where I have a command in place and I don't want it to, uh, don't necessarily want it to happen, I just press the escape key on my keyboard and it will return me back to defaults. So essentially you would you would click anywhere on the, the screen and then that command prompt will, will appear? I can be anywhere on the screen and as long as I'm typing into my keyboard. Oh, I see, okay. It will, it will actually show exactly what I'm looking for. Now, obviously being a newer, you know, having a new interface, we do have all these commands floating around the ribbon. But one thing you realize about AutoCAD is there are a lot of con a lot of commands that just don't have an icon here that you will use somewhat frequently. Things that are very common in those other softwares as well, like if we're grouping things, we can just type in group and suddenly it groups. I often tell my students when I teach this, and we teach this in grade 10, we review it in grade 11, and they use it frequently throughout. Um, if you think that there's something you want to do in AutoCAD, start typing it and see if there's a command for it, because sometimes there is. Now we'll go through some basic ones here. Right at the top of the ribbon, or in the middle of the ribbon here, we actually have our layers command, or layers menu. And this is the most important part when we're lasering. So if we take, pull up our layers menu, right now we start with the zero layer, and uh, zero layer is not a drawing layer, which you never put anything in the zero layer if you can help it. We simply go up to the uh, first icon here and create a new layer. And for our cut line, we need to do two things to make this work on the laser. The first is we need to change the color to red if we're using default settings. Your material settings and job control can be modified to recognize any RGB color, but the default is always red for cut lines. Uh, we've gotten a little fancy with some multicolored, multi-depth cuts, but uh, for the basic level, that's where you want to be. Lastly, you want to take your line weight, and you want to change your line weight to 0, 0.00. All right, now that we've got our cut layer, we can actually set up an engraved layer. And the only thing we require from an engraved layer is that it's in black. Easy enough. All right, we can close that menu down, and what you'll notice is now when I pull down menu, I actually have access to cut and engrave. So we're going to stick to cut layer because that's what we're going to do for most of this particular cut if we're just making a base plate or a mounting plate for a Tetris bar here. Now, the basics of drawing this uses your basic Cartesian coordinate plane. I often teach the students when we're creating lines, so if you just type in line, um, you can actually start at a coordinate point. So if you want to start something at a specific coordinate and run it to, you know, a different corner, we absolutely can do that. Now, whenever we're drawing things, one of the panels that I'm a big fan of personally is the properties panel. So if I want to know anything about this line, properties in my keyboard, press enter, and I get this menu. Now, yours probably popped up right about here, and that's all good. It actually tells us all the coordinate points of this particular line, line type, what color it is, etc., etc. I like to keep this menu pinned just so I have access to all of these things because occasionally it becomes you know, important to check the length of a line, to maybe move the end point of a line, rearrange it within the you know, grid system. That's something that uh, happens quite frequently. Now, what I'm going to create right now is just a very simple Tetrix bar. You'll notice that AutoCAD doesn't have units at all here. It, you, it basically will work in Imperial, it work in metric. It doesn't really care at this point. It just uses units. When we print to job control, we'll define what the units we were using are. For the most part, my students use Imperial, will do most things in inches, but I have a handful of students that are really in love with their metric system. That's fantastic. What we're going to start with is actually drawing out the bar, and I'm just very simply going to make my first line. Um, I can start it wherever I want, and you'll notice as I float around the uh, around my uh, actual model space here that my, uh, my line is going to snap to vertical, it's going to snap to horizontal. Uh, anything that shows zero degrees is three o'clock on the clock, anything that shows 90 is 12 o'clock, and if you have a negative 90, you will actually have it down at 6 o'clock. Basically, this allows you, by pressing the tab key, to draw a, in this case, I'm going to put a 32 millimeter line, press tab, and I'm going to draw it straight vertical. Sorry, apologize, I'm going to zoom out here. I obviously zoomed a little far in. And we're going to draw it straight up in the air. Now, if I click tab, I can type in any angle I wanted here, any number. In this case, I want 90. Now, I'm just going to throw in, uh, I'm going to throw in something somewhat easy here and just uh, make this uh, make this work. Actually, let's do, uh, let's do 128, let's do a 428 millimeter bar. 
Now, with these lines being where they are, apologize, I'm experiencing a little bit of lag here, the joy of school computers. Um, with these bars, the other option I have or another tool I have access to is the rectangle tool. So if you mean rectangle, I get this. There's also a key for this up at the top. For the rectangle tool, you'll notice that I can float over with snaps and I can actually float over any of my corners and actually follow a line um, to snap anything perpendicular to them. And that's actually something that's hugely useful. In this case, I'm going to use it to finish off my rectangle, kind of backwards in this case, but hey, there it is. I'm also going to go back and uh, try to select just my lines that I previously drew just to make sure that they're not there anymore. One thing you'll notice with the selection tool in AutoCAD is if I drag left to right, I get a blue lasso tool. And this will allow me to actually go around and just select a single line. Everything that falls in the blue completely is something that gets selected um, and life is good. If I drag right to left, I get the green dashed line. This is going to select anything I touch, just a little bit. It's really good for mass selections of things, but for the current maneuver we're doing, it's uh, not particularly useful. So let's select that other line and make it go away. Now, one of the things that we can do here is we can actually use our object snaps. You'll notice that we have a menu down here to actually select what we're snapping to. If you have the default settings on AutoCAD, yours probably looks about like this right now. Uh, I'm a big fan of keeping my midpoints on. I use them quite frequently and also geometric centers. They're quite useful as well. The other way to access this menu is typing in O-Snap or Object Snap, pressing Enter, and you'll get a menu very similar to that that'll let you decide what all you want to do. Um, it'll also let you select all clear all, turn them off, turn your grid snap on, all of those fun tools for where you want to, where you want to work. Now let's draw the rest of this bar. Uh, this bar in particular has a circle. I'm just going to draw a construction line here at the center point, and I'm going to draw it 16 millimeters again as it's based on the uh, rather common hole spacing for the robot that we build. I'll put an eight millimeter circle here. Now you'll notice that when I click the circle tool, it defaults to radius. This is nothing wrong with this if you have the radius, but if you want diameter, all you have to do is if you look down in your command prompt, you actually see it's saying specify radius of circle, or you can shift to actually specifying the diameter. I can click here, or I can type in diameter. Those both work. In this case, I have an eight millimeter diameter circle. There it is. I no longer need this construction line. I will delete it. Now, the other piece on this one is we do have some pieces that are arrayed. Now, you'll notice if I float over the circle, I get a center snap. This is important uh, because it allows us to draw another construction line and, in this case, put another circle in there. Circle in this case. Again, standard, uh, standard piece being what it is, I know that I have a diameter of 3.7 millimeters on this one. Again, you make enough of these things, you start to learn these uh, learn these particular coordinates, but for your drawing, it might depend on what you're actually drawing in this case. Now, the next piece we're going to do is use two commands that are called arrays that are actually going to allow us to reuse a lot of what we've drawn right now. The first thing we're going to reuse is we're going to actually array these circles around themselves so that uh, we get a whole pattern that is similar to the Tetrix brick. I'm just going to show you an example of that. We have an example of what we've done here. So this is the kind of whole pattern that we're looking for right now. I'm going to do a full version of it where I do eight holes instead of four, and we're going to go from there. What we do is we go to our array commands, which are up here in your uh, modified part of your ribbon. Press your little arrow here, and you have some options. We're going to use polar, and we're going to use rectangular array today as well, but path arrays are quite cool. Once we click on that, it's going to show the actual name of the command, array polar. It's going to ask us to select our object. In this case, we select the smaller circle and we press enter. At that point, it's going to say specify center point of array. Uh, we also have a few other options here, but I found in my experience, the center point is the most important piece. And I know so when we click that center point, the ribbon changed. It changed to our actual polar array ribbon, which is going to allow us to do a lot of things to this, including changing where things are, how many items we have. In this case, we wanted eight items. You'll notice that when we change the eight items, it actually fixes the degrees between them. It also uh, takes them at percent fill. If, for example, we wanted something only to fill half of the circle in a polar array, we do have that option. You'll notice that the uh, angles actually fix themselves. Um, and it's a fair bit of thing, or a fair bit of uh, fair number of options that we can work with here. If you're asking about rows here, just in case you're wondering, these will add extra rows outside the array and levels are actually going to kick this drawing. I'm just going to change these levels to 10 here. Levels are actually going to change this to three-dimensional space. We'll again talk about that very briefly at the end here. We're not going to work in three-dimensional space typically when lasering. 
You'll notice that moving these things around, I constantly use the view cube here in the top right. And uh, we do want eight items. We want one level and we want to close our array. Great. Sorry, just a quick question. If uh, Do you have any students uh, or in your experience where they would build a, an object in three dimension um, in AutoCAD and then they kind of split the levels up and then like, would that be easier? Like so they can uh, picture the, the design that they're doing and split it up into 2D for, for the cutting. Typically in my experience, AutoCAD, uh, oh, sorry, AutoCAD specifically is not as um, user friendly when dealing with 3D. A lot of professionals will use it in 3D uh, and they get very good with it. For my students, I find our 3D, kind of our high level design piece, we use Fusion 360 or even an Autodesk Inventor. Um, for this one, the major use of the 3D function is when we're bringing in part files. So if we're bringing in a 3D part file and we want to, say, trace a new piece to interface with it or to go over top of it, we will bring the 3D file in and then we will do the 2D drawing and then pull the 2D drawing out as a laser file. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So now the next piece here is with this piece, Having all of these together for arraying them at the next level is actually going to be easier if they are together. There's a few options to do this, but my favorite one is just using a group function. Again, just typing into the keyboard to group that. And then from there, we're actually going to rectangular array this. So we go to our array command, we go to rectangular array. Again, you can see that our actual command would have been array rect, and that is going to allow us to take this piece and array it in multiple rows and columns. In this case, I'm very simply, I actually want four columns, that's correct. Um, I actually only want one row because I do not have a second piece of this in this case. Again, levels will put this into 3D. And in this case, I actually want my distance between these to be 32 millimeters. Change that, you know, space them out equally on that bar. Again, the nice piece of standardized aluminum extrusion and uh, life is good from here. Now. If this is where this ends with uh, with the very basics, the circles, the lines, the arrays, uh, this might be time when we're actually going to go ahead and cut this bar. And so in this case, we're actually going to use Control P, or we can also pick and plot into AutoCAD. Again, some of the legacy pieces when this was commonly used on large scale plotters, some of those terminologies still uh, still exist and are still a lot of fun. This is our plot command, and this is the point I'm going to point you to the document that Lev has probably published or sent out at some point here around setting up AutoCAD. Uh, yeah, we'll actually put a link in the description of the video uh, to download the the step-by-step. -step. Now, the important part of the step-by-step -step guide, and I fought with this with the TroTech, is there's one line about five or six lines in that actually talks about swapping out one of the pieces of, I believe it's the config file, and uh, this is important so that TroTech, uh, so that the uh, job control, sorry, actually associates the DWG file you're creating right now in the correct way. Um, I fought with this beforehand and had very inconsistent results, but as soon as we changed that uh, that one line of code out, this worked fantastic. It's a great, uh, great piece of work here. Now, the very first step once we're in the plot menu is to select our TroTech engraver. This is going to take a second, again, for the school computers. This is a little bit of a, a little bit of a slog. It's going to ask us if we want default paper size or a custom paper size. For this particular model, it would fit on a normal 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper, which is my default, what I have set right now. But if I need to make a larger print, such as the blue robot that you saw earlier, we would define a new size paper. I'm going to show you how to do that right now. So we're going to go custom size paper. Mine may snap to 31 inches by 31 inches. If not, we're going to go set it to that. Again, this takes a second to load itself up and make sure all the settings are in place here to make sure we are able to cut, make sure we're able to export to job control. And here we go. All right, as you can see, I haven't reset my computer in a while. We have a bunch of, uh, bunch of A's on the end there from many versions of this cut. All right, so first of all, we're at eight and a half by 11. And I can't really tell where my cut is right now. So the first thing I'm going to do is go down to my plot scale. Now in this case, it says fit to paper. It's just going to stretch your drawing out to the paper, which in AutoCAD is not usually the intent. It's not really what we're going for. So if we turn off fit to paper, we change our scale. We can do any scale we would like. We can do inches and millimeters and any conversion factor here. In this case, I really just want to go one inch or one millimeter to one millimeter. You'll notice that when I went from inch to millimeter, it changed the scale. I'm just manually going to change this back to one to one. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my plot area, 
and I'm going to check my display. Uh, in this case, I'm going to check a window. I use this one quite frequently, um, but there are a few, a few options here. Window is going to allow me to just define what I want to do. Now you notice that when I did that, I actually it actually changed my print space here. It actually shows now where I'm trying to print in this case, um, and uh, in this case, it's going to fit. I have the choice of putting a portrait landscape depending on the orientation of my material. Uh, note that uh, at this point I have yet to find a way to actually rotate this in job control very easily, so I usually do this here at my end. Uh, my, uh, but you're welcome to uh, correct me if I'm wrong and show me something new here if there is a way to rotate it in job control. Uh, in job control itself or in the, the print screen? Uh, in the job control itself. Um, the, there are there are more functionalities with the job control cut uh, where you can actually do more in, in the software itself. I'm not sure if rotating is one of them, uh, to be honest. I haven't found it yet. Anyways, if we need a bigger build space, let's say we're building a base plate or a large scale, uh, large scale cut or print, we simply go to our properties tab here. This is going to allow us to go in and actually define a new paper size. I have a custom, uh, custom properties here. I have a custom paper size that I usually do, which I just set to 800 millimeters by 800 millimeters. It's way bigger than my print space, but uh, at the same time, it uh, works because I've set minimized job size. So this will always just shrink the print down to exactly what I'm cutting, which usually gets us the level of precision that we like here. There's a few other options in here. Uh, again, ones that I don't mess with, but should be pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory if you've done any degree of printing, plotting, or otherwise. Now again, this is going to take a second to load. It gives us the option of applying changes to the current plot only or to saving the changes. I go with the current plot because again, I'm on a school computer, so I have a few pieces of limited functionality here, but if you're doing the same cut over and over again, feel free to go there. At this point, I've got user-defined size paper. Uh, as you can see, this actually opened up to 800 millimeters by 800 millimeters like we defined, and you can see that our cut is quite small at the bottom here. We defined our drawing orientation, we've got our plot scale and our plot area. That's about as far as I go for most of my cuts. At this point, I'm just going to hit OK, and it's actually going to export this to Job Control, fire it up there, and uh, the rest of the uh, rest of the tutorials for Job Control can easily take it from there. Now, at this point, I just want to uh, I, I want to back up and show another functionality of this that is really neat. So, obviously, matching parts for robots was uh, was kind of where we went with this in the first place. But one of the really really interesting piece of this is we've used it for some other applications. We've done things like giant protractors for some of our visually impaired students here. We cut this out of a piece of acrylic and the actual drawing you're about to see doesn't have the numbers on it, but we used it to actually put those on here and make sure that that student actually had access to a protractor that they could, uh, they could visually see, which was very cool. And another piece we use it quite frequently for is actually building, um, is actually building prototypes for things. I'm just going to walk over quickly to my Twitter feed here. And this is an example of our FRC team. And this year's game is called Infinite Recharge. Uh, what you're seeing on the table in front of them is actually a couple of pieces of quarter-inch plywood cut on the Trotec and actually laid out with all of those parts in 3D so that they can tell what all the spacing for the belts, the motors, the gearboxes, and the shooting wheels in this case are. They hooked it up to an electrical system, and uh, here's the result of them prototyping to see if they can actually make the shot with this uh, particular setup. Yeah, it looks pretty amazing. What, uh, what material was this mostly made up from? That one, because it was a prototyping rig, and to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't expect it to survive the prototyping. Uh, we actually just cut it out of a scrap piece of quarter-inch plywood. It wasn't anything special. Um, mm. When we do the final version, we'll be probably cutting it out of some sort of ABS or something much uh, much more durable than the initial prototype. Uh, as, as expected, after testing that for a little while, uh, somebody fed a ball into it backwards, and the plywood actually shattered into small pieces. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes prototyping's a little bit messy, but that happens. All right. So the next piece I want to talk about briefly is part of the engraving and just bringing a logo or bringing something into AutoCAD. For that, I'm just going to hop over to our uh, polynomic motor holder. This was actually a robot part that was used to hold motors uh, in place and prevent them from spinning in ways we didn't want them to. And in this case, we put one of our robotics team's logos here, which is the 14717. And the easiest thing with putting logos into an AutoCAD drawing here, I found that JPEGs work fairly, fairly effectively. 
And it's actually just a matter, in this case, of grabbing your JPEG file, opening it up, and in this case, I'm just going to delete the one that's here. You'll notice that this uh, particular drawing is actually all grouped together. And because it's grouped, you can see that it's grouped in the properties menu here. Um, if I want to work with any piece of it, I need to explode it first. And to do that, I just type in explode into my, uh, into my command line. There is also a ribbon button for that one as well. Okay. And when I exploded it, you see it actually lost the uh, lost the reference for the actual logo. Let's go and delete these lines here. And we're going to go ahead and replace that. Once we get to our logo in JPEG, it's very simply a matter of copying this and pasting it into here. And you'll notice that it actually asks for your insertion point. It's going to ask for your scale factor. And from there, open oh, and orientation, and it's going to post your logo in. Now, a couple things with this. Since I had my cut layer pre selected on this, you'll notice that the logo actually came in with the cut layer line on the outside. If I leave this as is, it's actually going to cut the logo completely out, which is going to screw with our, uh, it's going to mess with our uh, ability to put this on anything useful. So in my, I can either go back to my home menu and move it into the engraved layer. Uh, also, I can try to move it into the zero layer, though often the outside of these will cut anyway. My other option is to go into my properties layer and simply change the layer that I'm actually in. So in this case, I'm in layer zero. I can change this to my, let's say, engraved layer. Now, once I've got this piece here and I've inserted it, I've got it in place, I press escape, uh, you'll notice it's sitting in front of my drawing. That's not ideal. Just like any other graphic arts software, I have the ability to right click and draw order this and actually send it to the back of my drawing. You'll notice that a few of the commands we've used here are also in this right click menu. Some of them would be kind of useful. Things like move, copy, scale are pretty standard, pretty common to use. Um, in this case, I actually want to move this to get a little more centered. So I'm going to type in move. And the cool thing about this is if I want to specify a particular base point, I can still use those object snaps from earlier. And the base point is what I'm going to click and drag this by and can be used to snap this object onto other things in my drawing. So in this case, I'm going to grab the midpoint at the top of the logo, and I'm going to snap it onto the midpoint at the top of this line to make sure that I've got perfect alignment on those. Obviously, in this case, it has it's supposed to, so I'm going to move it again. And I'm just simply going to grab a spot, and I can actually draw down here. You'll notice that it's showing the polar coordinates, and if I wanted to snap this down, let's say, three millimeters, I can type in three millimeters, highlight that I'm going vertically in the uh, downward direction, and press Enter, and it will snap it down that distance. Now, the last piece on here, I want to show you how to bring in a, in this case, bring in an actual CAD model or a CAD file and perhaps trace something out of it to work with the, uh, work with the uh, laser. In this case, I'm going to go back to my drawing one. I'm just going to make it go away. And I'm actually going to import a file in this case. So I'm just going to type in import. And what I'm looking for is what's called a step file. Now, step files are 3D modeling files. They're somewhat universal. Uh, pretty much every CAD software on the face of this planet will export to a step file. And so they get used for a lot of things, quite frankly. And uh, the one that I want here is actually this 1358. And once I import it, nothing really is going to happen. It's going to actually, uh, actually going to import it. You can see at the bottom here, it says import file processing complete. Okay file's ready to be imported, it's ready to be used. I'm just going to go to my block command for a second. Oop, sorry. Um, blocks are something kind of cool in AutoCAD. They're a reusable piece of text. And they're an example where when I do name tags in AutoCAD, for example, I will build a block that has preset pieces to all of the drawing and simply copy and paste it over and modify the text in there. Blocks are actually used by putting the insert command in what is it again? I've got this set. I use blocks quite frequently. Your, your um, menu probably came up like this. I can actually snap this here. And I'm going to go to my recent blocks. And you'll notice that I've got a few blocks here. So, for example, I've built some name tags for various projects. We may do this in a further webinar, how to actually put these together with the actual associated text. And something where I can have this actually pre-built. Uh, pre and clearly my font wasn't loaded properly in this particular drawing for that one, but hey. So it's almost like a, a little bit of programming where, you know, if you want to do name tags uh, and you want to fill in a whole slew of them, uh, you know, it's, you just make one kind of design of a block uh, and then you can insert the text that you want, that's want to have, right? That's absolutely correct. And uh, like I say, once you, once you drag these in and if you have them set up properly, 
um, you can simply just plug in whatever enterable fields you want and uh, drop them in. Life is good. Uh, here we go. Grab, uh, is it mostly with text or can you use like other parameters um, so what, I'm do, what I'm gonna do I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna drag this servo motor in here okay so this is one of the things that I've got and what you'll notice is that I've got this rather detailed view of the servo motor the reason for this is it came in as a step file and it is actually a fully 3d model in this case all right so this is the servo top plate which is the only piece I need if I want to match something to let's say bolt the servo onto it um, now in this case this whole servo came in in the cut layer so I'm gonna slap myself back to the top of it right here and I'm gonna grab this servo in its entirety and I'm just gonna move it over to another layer that I don't want to play with my layers are actually kind of powerful here one of the cool things you can do when you're in a layer is not only choose the color choose the line weight line type um, obviously I have a thick and grave on this one I'm just probably doing something funny on one of these blocks um, I also have the option to lock these layers. And so in this case, I put it in the zero layer. I am going to lock that layer because I want to draw over it. This basically means that I can snap to the layer, but I can't actually do anything with the layer. So at this point, this actually becomes very cool because if I want to create a cut, let's say I want to create a plate to base or to bolt the servo onto, I can very simply snap. I'm going to zoom into the corner here. I can snap to the corners of this, follow them along, snap to the corners of this, and actually find, for example, my intersection points. Here's my intersection point on this one. I'm going to clear a couple up. There we go. Follow this along. Wait till we meet. Here we are. It's not giving me my intersection snap. Let me go check if I have my intersection snap on. You have my intersection snap on. It's problematic. Anyways, we have to. Draw a line straight down. I'm going to draw a line straight across to make my intersection point. And in this case, I'm going to use a command called trim. And my trim command, after I press enter and enter again, is going to allow me just to cut the edges off of this to get my intersection. If I'm making a plate for this on the laser, I can simply grab here, zoom out, find my targets, and simply finish my rectangle. It also allows me to do things on the laser like snapping to the center point of a circle, actually drawing the radius on the circle, and in this case, I'm going to very quickly be able to generate a piece that is going to match exactly how I want this servo to work. Now, in this case, I'm just going to simply grab these two pieces here. And I'm going to use one more command before we uh, call, this a, call this a day. Click on my mirror command. And I'm going to actually draw a mirror line across the center point of my red lines here. Now, if all is well with the world, you should get two circles that are directly over top of that other half of that servo. I do not want to erase my first source object. And what you'll see is if this is a plate I'm going to use to mount onto a servo, let's say, I can actually match that CAD file exactly. Everything's locked right now in the zero layer, so I'm just simply going to move the plate out of the way, be on the servo, and I know very certainly that that is going to match up exactly to the part that I've actually brought in and I can actually laser plate to mount to it. I can actually build a piece of, uh, in my case, a robot that's going to uh, actually function pretty much the first time. Uh, except when the students make a few errors on these ones, but that happens. So that's kind of the basics of AutoCAD, a few of the applications I use it for and a few of the things that may be able to get you started. No, that uh, that was very cool. Um, any, any kind of advice you have for uh, beginners of, uh, of AutoCADs or like if, if teachers are, you know, for schools around the country, if they get AutoCAD with the laser, uh, so, anything at all? As a, as a teacher, a thing you, first thing you need to know is that Auto, Autodesk actually offers their products for educational use for free for educational institutions. Students can get accounts, they can download them at home. Not everybody has a computer powerful enough to run them. That's another piece is they are rather, uh, I use the term behemoth programs. They do everything, they absolutely do, but they do have significant system requirements, especially when you start working in the 3D realm. Um, my recommendation for AutoCAD though, at the end of the day is to start playing with it. It's just like any tool. I mean, the more you work with it, the more comfortable you become with it. And eventually you get to a point where it just becomes second nature. Of course, I would draw something in AutoCAD. Of course, we would throw something on the laser. And eventually, of course, we would build this kind of robot that's here behind me in, uh, in AutoCAD to make it work and actually make it a real life object. And, and how long do, do your students roughly get comfortable with it once they start learning it? 
So my course progression is we spend with uh, 70 minute long classes. Uh, I'll probably spend most of a term with them. So probably about two months worth of time every day. Um, they'll get very comfortable with the base functions of AutoCAD within the first week or two. And then after that, we go into some more advanced functions, 3D functions, technical design, how to do isometric orthographic uh, that aren't quite as related to just using the tool, but uh, mm -hmm. good draftsman skills, good engineering skills to have. Um, but most of my students pick it up within the first couple of weeks. So half mm -hmm. a dozen, dozen hours worth of work to become function or become comfortable with the basic functionality. Awesome. Yeah, so that's that's great advice. If you guys feel that AutoCAD looks complicated, I mean, I, I know for me it looks, because I'm, I'm used to Illustrator and Corel and Photoshop, uh, so for me 3D is always looks complicated, uh, but I, I agree with, with Mitchell if, um, you know, once you start playing around with the software, hopefully this webinar kind of gave you guys a good um, perception of the, the beginners, at least what to do in the beginning of what, uh, when you're making shapes and texts and you're printing it off to uh, to the laser machine. Uh, so once again, we'll post the step-by-step -step guide in the description uh, if you guys ever need to, to download it. Uh, if you have any questions, leave it in the comments uh, below and we'll try to address them as, as soon as possible. I'll, I'll reach out to Mitch if uh, we need to, to address them, if I can't answer them. I'm uh, actually also happy to answer questions on the educational side, again, as a teacher. And another role I hold is as a first senior mentor. So if any of you are doing first robotics teams and want specific advice on those ones, I'm very happy to help with those as well. No, that's that's great. That's awesome. Um, so thank you again, uh, Mitchell, for, for all the great for all the great work. We really, really appreciate it. Hopefully in the future we could do more uh, advanced webinars. But uh, this was the AutoCAD Basics. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thanks, Mitchell. Have a good one. Okay, take care.